Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Very fun episode today, Ed. Before we dive into that, I want to remind everybody we have a Cartoonist Kayfabe Patreon now. Uh, multiple layers there. And the top level, King Kayfaber, is actually watching us record these videos now. And today is going to be one of those videos that pays off to uh, be in the front of the Kayfabe effect because we're going to look at some books that you probably aren't familiar with at home but may want to add to your collection. So join our Patreon and get a little bit of a lead on uh, what we're going to be showing off. You get our videos early, you get to hang out with us while we record, and uh, get into some fun conversations there. The other thing I want to remind everyone, we are working cartoonists. The way we pay our bills is to sell books. So Ed's Red Room, Trigger Warnings, and Antisocial Network available now. The third season of Red Room gearing up and starting soon. I believe you can pre-order that one already. Hip Hop Family Tree celebrating 10 years. X-Men Grand Design. WYSIWYG all available from Ed Piscor's pen. And you can pick up Hulk Grand Design. The oversized collection is coming to stores soon. Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive, and Princess of Poverty, and The Plain Janes are my offerings that you can pick up wherever books are bought and sold. We appreciate that. If they're not on your shelf already, please add them. Ed, super fun video. I've been wanting to do this one for a while. Not even sure how to describe this exactly. We're calling it copycats, but I promise you at home, this is coming from a place of love. These are artists who I identify as very much um, referencing other artists in their style, in their approach. And uh, I have no problem with that. You know, there's going to be a lot of cool comments, I think, below this of other books that you could look at and say, oh yeah, a lot of Mike Mignola on those pages, even though it's not a Mike Mignola book, things of that nature. So I brought, uh, you know, we're going to look at five of these and um, we can begin now. And I'm sure everybody at home will kind of see what I'm talking about as we actually dive into a few of these. And the very first one, Richard Corbin is who I'm going to say this artist uh, probably enjoys. Yeah, but not that cover artist, because that's, that's a style biter of somebody else. <laughs> Very true. Uh, so the first one is War Guard, a really fun outlaw kind of black and white comic by Sean Patty. Absolutely love it. And if he doesn't love Richard Corbin, take away my comics past. Yeah, no, no doubt. And this is uh, Corbin on steroids, maybe some Bisley sprinkled in there, but I see Corbin what's, love. What's the year on uh, War Guard? This is 1997. Yeah, so like it feels like the uh, Richard Corbin kind of of this period in a way, like the one that's like just getting involved in like DC Comics with Brian Azzarello and stuff. He was doing like his lighting look kind of like this, but uh, Sean <laughs> Patty is is his own man and, and it's taking it to extremes. Not the last War Guard we're going to be seeing. Uh, on the on the kayfabe channel. No, and it's worth mentioning that I do think Sean Patty takes you know it, there's some major Richard Corbin ingredients in this book, little BWS, but he is definitely adding to it, making it his own, and making for a, just a fantastic comic. This is one Frisetta. I randomly found, you know, digging through dollar bins, didn't know it existed, fell in love with it instantly, and lucky us, there's at least two issues that are available. Um, man, the guy's putting a lot on these pages. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, the the beauty of, of digging in the bins, man, is uh, you grab anything you never heard of and you just give it a glance. That's right. Very often, uh, you know, it's dismal. It, like, there's a reason why you have never heard of it. But every now and then you come across something like this. And uh, you, you can't leave that in the bin. You will regret it for the rest of your life. You'll be thinking about it. You'll be dreaming about it because there's a hopeful piece to it. Like, this could be a great comic and just the guy doesn't have, like, this or that X Factor to, like, put himself out there. I feel like there's some biz in that right there. Yeah, which makes sense. I think there's some Corbin in Bisley. <laughs> sure. Uh, which is part of what makes this a fun topic for me is this is not a, uh, a slam against any of these artists because... We are all borrowing from everybody. And yeah. what happens a lot of times, a young artist will really show their influence on their sleeve when maybe there's a couple of people that are big influences. And then as you go on and have 10,000 influences, your stuff becomes your own because it's, you know, a finger from somebody, an eyeball from somebody. And pretty soon it's impossible to uh, kind of take it apart. You know, it really does become your own. But these comics, man, this is what I hope to find whenever I, whenever I go to a comic book shop. Just absolutely beautiful stuff, page after page. And, and you can see the page counts. These are big oversized issues. So anybody watching at home, if you uh, come across one of these war guards, you will not be disappointed to add that one to your take. And uh, kind of funny to think that there are a couple of uh, big Richard Corbin guys out there. This is 
John Cebolero, not sure if I'm saying that right or not, but also uh, one of the guys that are in a lot of these is Rick Parker. So I have two examples of this John Cebolero. Again, kind of randomly found him. You can see it's Event Comics, which was Joe Quesada and Jimmy Palmiotti's company. Um, and in this case, it's Cebolero and Parker teaming up. And they just say story art and letters. So I don't know how exactly this is working, who's doing what. But you see, certainly see the Rick Parker letters, no doubt. I mean, this is another one of those where, for me, as a black and white comic, it's just gorgeous. Yeah, this is good. I don't know this. And, and dude, go back one page. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The Richard Corbin is not, uh, I guess I'm not putting words in anyone's mouth here. <laughs> like, clearly, that influence is on the sleeve there. Uh, not, there's never enough Richard Corbin in my collection. So yeah. if you really want to, uh, idolize him, the nice thing when somebody's really into a certain style or an artist, you'll see that art through a different lens, right? You know, it's never going to be exactly whoever the, uh, the, the inspiration is. I'll say this is pretty sharp stuff because very often what people will do, and we'll see it in the, one of the primo examples you're going to show off uh, towards the end of this video, I guess. But uh, they will just take the surface elements, the, the most superficial, superficial, shallow pieces of their work. And uh, this, this guy, I mean, this guy's solid. Yeah, really fun stuff. And I have found two examples of, of his work so far. This Kid Death and Fluffy, the second one, uh, same deal, you know, it's very Richard Corbin-esque, but it's, it's a much shorter uh, series or story, but you know what you see here is we're at a comic book convention and we see creepies and eeries, and I don't think that's accidental. You know, no. like there really is an acknowledgement, I think, of um, what we're pulling from in here. So you can't have one without the other. Absolutely beautiful stuff, in my opinion. And I mentioned Bisley a couple times, so I'm going to bring Alex Horley up next. Horley is a guy who I think can do everything. If you follow his career, he's done a bunch of different books and a bunch of different styles. There are times when he's channeling Bisley, and so that's what I thought I would pull out in this case, but not the only thing that Horley does. Like, this guy really is and, can and, do it all. And, and not the only Bisley style biter. Uh, go to any sort of late 90s, uh, yeah. 2000 AD comic, and there's a lot of those guys who really get close, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, even there would be... We, we did episodes of Wizard or something where, where Glenn Fabry and, mm -hmm. and uh, B Bisley were kind of going back and forth, and, and Bisley's like, yeah, Glenn Fabry always is, uh, you know, two steps behind me and shit like that. <laughs> but uh, that was almost like an editorial mandate, it felt like, to have your, your Bisley yes. uh, rippers. And uh, I'm sure we're going to get a lot of names named uh, in the uh, comments to that effect. And hopefully some I'm not familiar with that will give me some new uh, Bisley-esque stuff to look at. But this one's kind of cool because there's both painting and line art. Just like Biz does, exactly, man. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, you see it. It's the oversized muscles, the, the oversized boobs, just all the stuff that I think is a Bisley trademark. Veins popping out of these muscles. No backgrounds. <laughs> no backgrounds. Horns, you know, on your helmets. Um, I think you can see the Bisley at home, especially if you're a Bisley fan. It's pretty apparent. But, you know, I mentioned that he does all these different styles, Alex Horley, and you can see uh, some of that stuff in these doing throwbacks, right? This is a comic about comics history, so you have to have some of your Golden Age stuff, and you can see his ability to do that. But here we go back into the Bisley paradigm of the present, although this present 20 years ago at this point. <laughs> but, I mean, very Bisley-esque, sure. some of these images. And, yeah, I would love to see everybody calling out some of the... Uh, some of the other Bisley-esque elements out there. So this guy, do you, you, I think we've talked about Cleary before. Yeah, he was first on my radar with the, uh, with the um, comics that were in, packed in with the toys for Spawn. Okay, so this is a Todd McFarlane-esque, is, is who I would point to. And some of it is more McFarlane than other parts. Definitely, I think his line art, like the surface stuff, is probably the most McFarlane-esque stuff. And McFarlane employed him for things. And then, and then he went full McFarlane. That with Boof and the Bruise Crew and shit like that. That's that's pretty pretty full on McFarlane, in my opinion. Yeah, and this is probably where people could call out. I, and I think clearly, clearly was a part of that. Like there was that Hall of Heroes company. Yes, and, and there, there were a few artists in Hall of Heroes and, that would remind me of. And I think Cleary is one of them. I think he had something. Yeah, I can't remember. I feel like we may have done something like this in the past where we just look at McFarlane. It might have been in a Wizard episode. Yeah. 
but when Image first starts, there are so many people that are doing McFarlane style, you know, like really, I mean, he's the big guy. And then once there's like the Extreme Studios and the Wild Storm, you get to see like a bunch of Liefeld guys, a bunch of Jim Lee guys, and McFarlane didn't have that studio. So you end up seeing a lot of these other artists that sort of exert their influence on people. But McFarlane for a while in that late 80s, early 90s, there were a lot of artists that were really sort of uh, following his, his example if you will. And uh, an example here in black and white of John Cleary's work. This was a dream to me to, to like be able to get to see uh, McFarlane's pen and ink uh, in black and white. It's a wonder McFarlane hasn't done a ta- hasn't done a spawn black and white of just re-releasing those original spawn issues in right. black and white. I think there'd be an audience for that. Yeah, totally. Almost like the, the Vertigo Essentials. You can see Cleary is pulling from that whole image era, man. Like, you know, some J. Scott yeah, Jim Lee-ish type shit right there. Yeah, that also happens, I think, in a lot of these. Um, this. Yeah, yeah, not as, not nearly as much McFarlane there. Although some of the, still some of those marks feel like they line up that way. I always wonder what happened to uh, Cleary because, like, he what? was a young dude and did a lot of work. You know, like here he is on Satan Six. It's a danger. <clears throat> it's a danger of playing around with these styles and, and not really developing your own style because those those guys are flash in the pan. Styles and when that shit goes goes away and you don't have your own identity, you're fucked, man. That's fair. The cartoon distortion of this, I love it. That kind of stuff just screams at me. It looks like that um, that Doom Squad or whatever that yeah, that, that yeah, like yeah. Grant he, Morrison. He'd have been great on a book like that. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like I think he's legit good, John Cleary, and uh, that's why it disappoints me that we don't have more comics from him. You know, he, he shines brightly for a short period, but this is the Topps Kirby verse stuff. There are actual Kirby pages in here, inked by some interesting guys like Frank Miller, inking a Jack Kirby page right here. How about that for a crazy pool? Because, I mean, I'm sure this was, you know, a 50-cent book that I pulled out. But talk about getting, like, some real bombast, yeah. you know, in an issue. Um, and you can see, I think, Cleary is still marks that resemble McFarlane, but has gone in a different direction in terms of, like, his figures and the cartoony style, you know, really pushing and probably pushing into his own you know this i didn't check the chronology but i bet you this is later stuff i mean that is doom squad hatching right there like can you even call that hatching if you could fit your finger in between the lines is it hatching (laughs) uh mark pasella and dan panosian would do this on some of those x-force fill-in issues absolutely they would and i hated it at the time and now i look at it and i absolutely love it I brought Shadow Slasher along. This one is probably stylistically, you'll see a lot of different, uh, different probably influences in here. I think there's some McFarlane isms. This is almost tone wise McFarlane because yeah. there's religious stuff. In <laughs> the the sort of weird oh, it's Jay Lee to it. Yeah. Uh, the weird way he draws these faces is so common for that like mid nineties. Self self uh, published comic creator. I thought that uh, the building there very McFarlane esque, which is an odd thing to pull out. He's just adding more windows to it. Yeah, absolutely. And Shadow Slasher for anyone unfamiliar, this is uh, this was published for. I mean, this is issue seven, and I think there's actually more issues than that. Uh, ran for a while, and you know, again, the image influence at this time is huge. It's cool that you mentioned Jay Lee because I have a Jay Lee in here that I'm going to pull out. I think this kind of like just marks on every piece. That's one of those McFarlane isms, but really it's kind of an image ism. There's there's a lot of folk art to this one because this guy doesn't know the the tools that are typically used and shit. And you just see all this like tech pen kind of stuff being done. Yeah, you know it's very it's very outsider. It is. Um, but you mentioned Jay Jay Lee and. These guys would be so influential for like windows of time, yeah, you know, and then and then their influence changes or their style changes, and I and I feel like that can be lost, you know, if you weren't around looking at this stuff at the time, you might not remember it, right? But one that I think everybody's going to remember is Frank Miller. I feel like you should close out on the Frank because it's such a big piece. Man. That is a big piece. A little teaser there for you guys to stick <laughs> through the end of this video. You mentioned Jay Lee, so let's go to Jay Lee next. Ravager number one. This is a. This is actually what started me. These two issues are what made me want to do this video. So this is going to be Stephen Platt. This is going to be Jay Lee. I just found these recently. 
This is 1997, but the Jay Lee to me is the Savage Namor era. This is the, the Jay Lee that I fell in love with. It was the early, you know, some of the first Jay Lee I saw where it's like, this dude's doing stuff that nobody else is doing. Jay Lee, I mean. And then I think this guy was like, oh yeah, I agree with you. Because like the silhouette figures was something that you would see in a lot of those Namor issues that he was putting out quick. This kind of like spikes and almost highlights the wrinkles on the skin of the face, these are all things you can find in that Jay Lee Namor run. Uh, yeah, sure. And I mean, it, that's that's in the image stuff. Like, that's Chapel. Like, there's plenty of that. The, like, the, the eye wrinkle stuff. Like, okay, this is this, this kind of shit is definitely like the Savage Namor thing. This ponytail, I think, yeah. is, a, is a very Jay Lee esque treatment of ponytail. You were mentioning Tools Ed. This is like a ballpoint pen or a ruler ball pen for like your background hatching. And the dude just doesn't care about lettering at all. Like, it's, it's, it's illegible. It's pretty dense too. It's one of those guys that's and, like really putting stuff on. And you cannot tell how to read it. And like this dude just wants to draw. You know that not telling how to read it stuff? Feels like Jay Lee of that era, man. He was doing, I think at some points, like nine pages a day. This and it was like all these were like figures were all silhouettes. See, this is another like folk arty piece. Because this guy like discovered Jay Lee and just went ham. See, yes. th see this is like that that uh, Young Blood Strike file type shit. Definitely. Yeah, I was such a Jay Lee mark of that time period that, like, whenever I, I, you pull it out of the fifty cent bin, Ed, and you flip it open, and you're like, oh, this is this is going home with oh, me. Oh, this comes home. This is such a, a sweet spot for my own kind of personal history of comics. But like, even the folds in the clothing, if you were really into Jay Lee in that early '90s time period, it's all over these pages. And it always makes me wonder, like, does this guy go on to do more? Um, if you're Jay Lee, did you see this? I mean, right. it's yeah. through and through, you That's know, the ads, you know, for, for the chapel comics. Yeah. I, I love this stuff. And like I said, I was excited to figure out like, how do we look at this in a way, you know, what's an excuse to look at this? Cause I don't know that I've never heard this comic mentioned. Yeah. You know, sometimes these outlaw comics will have a, they'll have, they'll be known even yeah. if I haven't seen them, you know, you've heard of them, but this is something I had never heard of. And it was just like such a cool piece to pull out. And then Morbid Angel number three. So London Knight is definitely a publisher that's out there, you know, probably known for kind of bad girl stuff. And what I saw whenever I opened this, pencils by Shelby Robertson. Um, I don't know about inks aren't credited. So I don't know if this is, I can't imagine this is reproduced from no, the pencils. No. So maybe he's doing pencils and inks. Maybe it's just not a, not a credit that I saw there. But first thing you see are the gigantic quad muscles, striations already starting to... Here's, here's how deep it is, though. Like, like, just show page one again real quick. These are Stephen Platt hands. Like, that's from Moon Knight. Yeah. The, the exact way they're drawn. So this guy is, like, looking at Stephen Platt at the most molecular level. This is something that always struck me with the uh, Stephen Platt stuff was uh, when he would have these like gigantic bulgy muscles, but there's like a spandex pant, and there's just one little tent, like a little bridge yeah. of fabric from one quad to the next through that line was just genius. I never knew, like, is that supposed to be a vein? And then also like Del Kion would do sort of that kind of thing too. And I would always wonder like, how do you do that through the hatching? Like it must've been white outed and then you put your shadow under it. Yeah, I loved it too. I was with you 100%. This is a 1997 publication as well. And it makes me wonder like what state Extreme Studios was in because dude, this would have been like a top 3 Extreme Studios artist if he, if if he'd have shown up at the right time in history. Who was that one guy who was doing those like Supreme comics that like Palo or something Petty. like that? Petty. And I've tracked down, I think he did two issues and I've tracked those down. And it's bizarre. Like there's McFarlane, there's Platt. Yeah, exactly. It's cool. Very strange, though. Uh, but you can see, like, you know, to me, this is such a plat kind of... All of it, the weapon. <laughs> it's it's really getting so away from the guy and stuff. <laughs> like, like I, I would bet that the guy doesn't even know what he's drawing right there. And and this is that very specific... Like, this is... That, that Bloodshot Prophet comic came out. Because that was the drawing that was on that previous page is definitely that. Yeah, I mean, this is my sweet spot for Platt. You uh -huh. know, I, it's it's definitely the stuff. That... And this guy's too, probably. So it's like, we, we're not getting it. You know, that was the void that, uh, that like, the image dudes had with um, Art Adams. It's like, okay, we're not going to get more than two Art Adams comics in a year. Like, we'll be the, the worst versions and just put them out more regularly. Jim Lee. 
Totally. That's a Jim Lee face. You could probably find a dozen versions sure. of that face out there. But I just, I love it. It's fun. He starts to powder. Like, like towards the end, he's done. Like, like he shot his fucking load, and he's, he, it's, it's over for him. That's a really great panel. I don't know, you know, I don't know if that's a swipe from something or not, but that's a really good panel. I, it's not one I recognize off the bat. But the amount of hatching that everybody would do, like, that was such a trend. That sure. kind of, like, hatch the face, like, you can't put too many lines on it. And then that one, where the, <laughs> like, that's Scott Williams' tick right there. Totally. Like, like what, what, what are you telling us with that? So, I have a million questions for people to make comments all over this video. And one <laughs> of them is, tell me more about either of these artists. If they've got, like, a body of work... Put it out there. See, it triggers me because these are the ladies that would be coming to the Pittsburgh Comic Con. Yeah. Like, like Everett Hartso had the big booth. Oh and, yeah, and he would be he would bring like all those chicks. I don't know if I've said it before on Air Ed, but my first time was setting up at Pittsburgh in the Playmate uh, Everett Hartso kind of aisle where it was all women of various. I think from like nineteen uh, seventies Playmate up to like I think just hookers were at one end of the aisle yeah and that's what I was in the middle of my first comic convention with your big yellow jumpsuits and shit in, insanity right yeah absolute insanity my brother saw his first uh, female pubes uh, at the Everett Hartso table because some lady's <laughs> g-string was all to the side I like this and color. then and then the next year like some catholic league or something uh caused a lot of trouble because because they were like you guys are advertising this with Spider-Man on the cover. We brought our kids yeah. to this thing. And you have these chicks who are taking their titty out, putting lipstick on their nipple, and pressing a blank yep. business card to their nipple and charging dudes $50 for that. I was that. very confused by that. that, that and, her, and, and Gloria Ann Gilbert was her name. And, and, and she had a line out the building. It was. They did good business all weekend when I was there. I think I sold two com comic books all weekend. There were lines at tables. All right, so the last uh, the last artist here that I have as being you know stylized a lot, uh, copied from other people is Frank Miller. Yes. Post Sin City, it was like everybody did some version of Frank Miller, and these are really cool because like this is Barry Kitson. This is the somebody gave us this at Baltimore, I believe. If you know Barry Kitson's art, it does not look like this at all. You know, I think this was like a one issue experiment with this, possibly a deadline issue because this one looks fast to me. But it's completely different than his work, but it's that very heavy blacks, um, no real outlines. You know, you look at like this Batman, that colorist is doing heavy, pretty heavy lifting because, you know, the cow is not defined by buildings or some kind of shadow there. It's like, have the colorist go in there and add that piece. I'd be curious to see these in black and white, actually. This kind of style is built for black and white. It's a joke to put it in color. Like, even when Frank Miller, we've seen color... Sin City Comics, you with that last Helen back. Yeah. He doesn't draw it this way for color. Like right. so, these guys. This is that classic thing. They're just taking the surface elements of something that's popular and trying to use it to, you know, gain some clout. Yeah, I think that it was one of those things. Like, I mean, my sketchbooks at the time were completely full of this stuff. I think that everybody just saw it and was blown away. And then it was like, how does this work? How do you play with this? What can you do with it? I think there was backlash against the image. Scott Williams, like heavy, you know, 10,000 lines cross hatched on a face, like just make it black or white. So I think there's some interesting stuff here. And it's cool whenever an artist like a Barry Kitson, who he's a guy that draws everything. You know, if you look at his work, it's not like a shortcut guy he knows what he's doing. So this is like a real experimental comic. You know, I can't think of anything else of his that looks anything like this. Yeah. But we're going to see, like I said, everybody does versions of this. This is the um, Image X month. We looked at this in depth. Rob Liefeld, I think, doing uh, some treatment of this. And I think at some point, they're talking to each other. You know, because like Jim Lee does Death Blow. And I think you see, oh, okay, the Death Blow, there's some Death Blow-esque elements in here. Yeah. But this is that same deal <laughs> where like, I'd love to see this in black and white. Yeah, and you can't find those pages you, uh, on comic art fans of places like that. But, I mean, that was clearly Marv on that previous page. It's like, is there a doubt? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's a lot of fun to see guys with established styles trying their hand at this kind of thing. And and the thing that they all miss that, that Miller would do with his thing is he would use pen also. Like, so these guys are just uh, capturing those solid black forms, but not not some of the other pieces. I forgot about this. The uh, Bill Morrison 
it's kind of a funny example because like you think of the Simpsons, it's the same deal. Like all of those bongo comics that look like they were on model are artists that are essentially copying a style guy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's almost in, in some ways this is, this is house style, right? Where an artist is putting their style a little bit under in order to make it fit and work right. This is Huntress. And I have um, three out of four issues of this. And it's, it's great because it, forms yeah somehow i i, I have this here uh, we go yeah i have you this know, run i love there's there's a few of these there's a travis charest did this with wild storm comics where like nine covers fit together frank miller did it with valiant and unity where like the eight covers all loosely fit together uh so you get it here i don't know if this is an homage to unity or not but it's definitely in line with that kind of miller-esque style here's the thing though. this is mike netzer and mike netzer is also mike nasser who had a very Neil Adams style in the early '80s? That's a guy that we that could easily be the subject of like a copycat. Uh, he churned out copycats, but Netzer had just the most egregious uh, kind of Neil Adams style in the early '80s, and he in fact uh, was in litigation against uh, Neil Adams saying that he created the Miss Mystic character and that and that uh, okay. no, no Adams took it. So this guy, uh, he, I, I feel like this guy actually got shamed a lot because he was the Neil Adams goof. And now he here he's like the uh, Frank Miller right. goof. It, it was some of my reservation of doing an episode like this is that I don't view this shamefully. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like to me, I, I like seeing this. Like, it's really interesting to me to see, like, how does somebody try to make this work? Like, this is one of those where your colorist is doing a bunch of drawing and I wish he wasn't. Like, no, I, yeah, I, yeah, it's built for black and white. Every like piece said. of this I'd rather see in black and white. Yeah. And, you know, this is what your alternative is, where it's just like this busy kind of line heavy style. So <laughs> I can see why, you know, people would kind of go and, and want to do this. And I think there are some artists that really made that style work for them and developed a, uh, a strong black and white. Deathblow, I think we've talked about maybe just on Darker Image, um, but there's conversation in Wizard magazines where... Frank Miller was not cool with this. No, he wasn't. And I think Jim Lee's pretty clear on how much of an influence Miller was. Like, he talked about, like, they would photocopy the Sin Cities from Dark Horse Presents and make their own... You know, TPVs. Bo bootleg of Sin City. So, you know, clearly that was an influence uh, that Jim Lee was looking at. Speaking of Jay Lee of that era. There it is, man. This stuff, uh, with this kind of clear line, it, uh, Jeff Darrow was out at that time with, with Hard Boiled and things. Um, but there's also like a... And if you just keep going, like when we see the side view of Lynch... There's a, uh, see, there's Jay Lee built into that also. There, there's definitely, you know, all these guys bring other stuff. You know, this feels like you're going outside of the Miller language quite a bit. And I would even say, like, whenever you go to this extreme of, like, the very fine white lines or negative space, it's pushing that Miller style to, like, an nth degree. Yeah, yeah, but there's uh, there's Carlos Esquerza in this stuff to me. Uh, it might be more like the de the Deathmate Red. Mm. Or no, 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 what was a uh, darker image? No, Dar Darker Image, yeah. or yeah, Darker Image One. Is that what it's called? Yep. This is uh, this is probably one that's very far. You can see outside of the Frank Miller Sin City esque element, which yeah. I think happens. You know, like when Tim Sell comes on board in issue three, you you kind of see it again, where it's like there's a starting point that might be Sin City, but then also it's just going much much further. All right, man. Curious about this stuff. I don't know it. This is, you can see right from the get-go, I think, on this cover. To me, there's a lot of death blow, is, is what you're seeing. Right. This first issue, probably not as much, but there are glimpses of it. Yeah, You yeah, know, sure. like, like some of that, I mean, that's... That's, 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 that, that's that image. Yeah, it really, really <laughs> feels close. You know, <laughs> close to that one. Um, but as this goes forward, it becomes, I think, more and more pronounced. There's so much coloring on this that it's not quite as obvious. But what I see in this, a lack of outline and just big solid blacks. Right. And it's a little bit sloppy in, in some cases. And I don't, it might not be the right word because it's not meant as a negative way, but it feels loose. You know, like the way these marks, they're not as planned or organized as what we saw in Death Blow or what we saw in probably the first Sin City, for example. But it's definitely built on like these big thick pieces of ink just laid down and even like just negative outlines for your figures like reverse silhouettes as you come through here again not closing off your your kind of open edges with a line and you can see there's con this this is in dialogue with death blow right sure but i think it is still part of that school of the sin cities and what frank miller frank miller man 
Sin City had an influence. It did. You know? It did. And in, 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 in interviews and things, he would always talk about like the, the um, guys who were cribbing. And I've, I've, I knew the big ones, but to see a video like this and to actually get to get to check that stuff out, it's, it's, it's very cool. So this is Ben Torres uh, doing Night Watchmen. There was an image version. It's exactly the same comic, so a reprint of that. And this is part of the Big Bang comics. Um, some were self-published, some were caliber, some were image comics. Some of this stuff, though, to me is super Frank Miller-esque as well as this. And it's not just the Sin City reference. You know, this is uh, this is stuff that we've seen all the way back to Daredevil. Yeah, I was just looking because it looks like maybe some lettering differences. I don't know. Yeah, it's funny that I ended up with... I have one issue of each of these series, and it's the same stupid issue. Right. So dumb. But you can see the heavy blacks. Um, he's doing a few other things. You know, it's not straight Miller, but some of the Miller stuff actually goes back to things like Dark Knight Returns yeah. to Daredevil. And I think it's pretty clear that uh, Miller is your big predominant influence on this style. Though I've seen this in X-Force 1. <laughs> Fair enough. With Brian Murray color. Yeah, you know, like some of the, the shadows around this face. <laughs> He's like in his hospital bed with like bandages <laughs> and his, his mask on. Is that what that is? Die with your mask on, right? <laughs> he, read, he read Brat Pack. You know, almost the, the Miller-esque Joker. Fun. Yeah, so a lot of these Frank Millers, and honestly, I could have pulled out probably 20 more of the Frank Millers. It's a matter of going through the collection and, and trying to think of, like, which comics do this. Scott McDaniel Daredevil was yes. something I was buying at the time. Yes, absolutely. And I know that one because I remember that was when I was most aping the Frank Miller stuff in my sketchbooks. And so Scott McDaniel I'd look at, and it was kind of the same thing of, like, blacks but no outlines. And I can remember talking to Ernie Steiner, the first pro I ever really talked to, and we talked about that, the style, and how that Miller style was really influencing all kinds of stuff. And, and he thought I nailed it pretty well, but for what that's worth. You know, like, that's not uh, obviously... The way I broke in, but yeah, I feel like Steiner even used a little bit of that in like this. He did a, some pieces in like an X Men Annual or something that had like the heavy blacks, and maybe it was more Mignola. I got to look at that shit again. And you know, the fun part of this conversation is you can look at that Miller stuff and then be like, oh, we can go back to like a bunch of European guys that were doing some of this stuff. You know, the Hugo Pratt's. There's a lot of mark making in Hugo Pratt that I think you can see on Frank Miller's Sin City. Go Seki Kojima, anyone? Yeah, man, for Ronan. <laughs> <laughs> so. Anyway, to me, this is a fun stuff, and I hope that uh, we see some comments that kind of build on this, because I think there's this is how you connect the dots of uh, comics history and what these influences are, and some are bigger than others. Absolutely, man. Good stuff, fun video. Put your comments directly below. Let's keep the conversation rocking. And, uh, man, covered a lot of comics, a lot of ground today, and the kayfabe effect is real. The people who benefit the most are uh, the King Kayfabers who support the Patreon. Get to see these videos before anybody else. In the description below, you can get there. But there's many ways to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Jimmy, tell the people what you have out there. Hulk Grand Design coming to comic shops in February. Big oversized edition, fluorescent ink on the cover. I got an advanced copy and posted a video about that. Highly recommend you guys reserve your copy today at your local comic shop. Or pre-order it if you haven't already because they are selling fast on Amazon. Street Angel, Deadly Squirrel Live, Plain Jane's also available, and Street Angel, Princess of Poverty available for pre-order. You can also join my Patreon at patreon.com slash jimrug and see a lot more of my comics and art and what I'm working on. My most recent post uh, updates on the big oil painting stuff that I did last week. So check that out, and uh, back to you, Ed. All right, man. Crypto Killers. Red Room Crypto Killers issue number one is being solicited in comic shops right now. We're going to put it out on a monthly basis for four complete issues. It's not getting a trade paperback this year, so if you want to read the comics, you got you got to get those OG issues. Two trade paperbacks for Red Room uh, are out there right now, The Antisocial Network and Trigger Warnings. Ten-year anniversary of Hip Hop Family Tree Comics. Uh, I'm serializing the new Red Room comics on my Patreon before anybody gets to see. Three bucks for that. More than 300 pages of comics up there now. Uh, X-Men Grand Design is out there, WYSIWYG, a lot of ways to support the uh, the, the books, uh, but what else do we have, Jim? Subscribe to the Cartoonist KFAB newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist KFAB t-shirts, merchandise, hats, stickers, mugs, fanny packs, and more at our spread shop. That link is also below this video. Great ways to support the channel. Keep these videos rocking. Give them those marching orders. We'll be on our way. Read more comics.